When people look at my work for the first time, they're kind of confused. Most think it's a painting. Some think it's something computer generated. But if you look really closely at the little lines that make up the partying of the plastic sea, each and every one of those represent a single-use plastic straw. What you don't see is the work that went into building this art installation. 168,000 plastic straws collected over the course of nine months with the help of hundreds of volunteers that we then had to collect, sort, clean, organize, and convert into this Guinness Record art installation, all to show how small little individual actions really add up. But what you really don't see, and what I'd like to talk about today, is the person behind the art. Not Von Wong, the artist, but Ben, the human being. And the part of me that drives all of this creativity. It's a part of me that I think we all have inside of us to some extent, um, but one that I think is probably a superpower. The thing that drives my creativity is actually a fear. It's a deep fear of irrelevancy. I'm going to expand upon that a little bit more. So let's go back a little bit to childhood, because I think childhood is always a fun place to start. Growing up, I had a little bit of a problem. I was a walking stereotype. See, I, was, I did martial arts. I also played the violin. To make things worse, I was actually good at math and physics. So I really just <laughs> dropped into the stereotype there. And as I got older, things didn't really get better. My dad was an engineer. I figured, what else am I going to do? I'm going to be an engineer, too. And over time, I mean, it wasn't because I felt like I had to. It was more like I didn't know what else to do with myself. I was trying all sorts of things on the side, hobbies, trying desperately to find something that resonated where I could feel like my own independent human. And it was only until I found this little thing, a camera, where things really started to change. So much so that three years after finding a camera, I ended up quitting my day job to see what would happen next. See, the camera was a fantastic tool. It allowed me to talk to people I would never get the chance to talk to. I could go to places I would never go otherwise. I could meet people and create something straight out of my mind that never existed. And so for a little while, it felt like I had a voice. One of my earliest successes was this project over here, where I decided to tie a model 30, mo 30 meters underwater in a shipwreck in Bali. Uh, this went pretty viral. It was featured on Board Panda, Laughing Squid, The Colossal, all these different art blogs. It was even trending on Facebook for a good 24 hours back when Facebook had trending. And for that little brief period of time, I felt, wow, this is awesome. What I do matters. And I just thought, well, if it's working, I might as well just keep going at it, right? I had stumbled across a formula, which is basically that if you had a really great, catchy title, you could get things seen. And so I just pursued that, whether it was putting superheroes on the edge of a 40-story skyscraper, or going to the world's largest monastic library in Austria and trying to recreate a real-world Beauty and the Beast. This was a photo that I created with nothing more than a cell phone, these wings of fire, uh, long Kevlar ropes to create the wings. And for a while, life was fun. Over time, I started to realize that there was a different kind of relevancy that was important to me. You see, this relevancy was fun. It pushed me to explore a completely different side of me, to find out what was truly unique about me. Right? And so it had a utility to it. But over time, I started to wonder, well, what would it mean to create work that was actually relevant? What would it be like to create work that actually mattered? You see, what was interesting is that all the successes that I had experienced until that point, I thought was a result of the art that I created. But actually, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time with the right skill set. See, this was, the, this was the time of clickbaits, right? This was a time where people loved catchy headlines. And so I was riding that wave. But as, as most waves go, as most trends go, um, these trends change. And today, we've entered kind of a new trend. We've entered the trend of the influencer the Instagrammer, where it isn't so much about creating things that are unique and different, but rather creating things that are a little bit more of the same. Same, same, but different. And my hypothesis here, I'm not an engineer, but my hypothesis is because 
entertainment generates more clicks and engagement than art. And this is how I define the difference between the two. Entertainment is like junk food. You can eat it all day long, but it doesn't really nourish your soul or body. It actually probably makes you a little bit worse off. Whereas art, on the other hand, is slightly uncomfortable, challenges the way you see the world, changes your perspectives a bit. And I was at this point where I really wanted to start creating more art. Um, and, I didn't, and I wanted this art to truly mean something. And so I started looking around in the world. I started to figure out, well, what could make my work relevant? And this conscious decision to go against relevancy, the popularity contest, and relevancy in the world was a pretty interesting one. It, because at the end of the day, it's that same fear of irrelevancy, but just morphed slightly different. And so where did that bring me? It brought me to all sorts of interesting places, as usual. This one project in an abandoned factory in Vietnam, uh, uh, sorry, in Cambodia, an abandoned factory in Cambodia, which went bankrupt in 2008, a garment factory, where uh, all of these pieces of clothing were just left behind when the, 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 the company went bankrupt in 2008. And I decided, hey, why not create a project to talk about the environmental impact of the clothes we wear? Every single cotton t-shirt uses 2,500 liters of water. What about an entire closet? Wouldn't that be a waterfall? I discover all sorts of other interesting facts in my journeys, like how the clothing that we wear, polyester, nylon, spandex, all this is actually made of plastic. And so what happens when you put plastic into the laundry machine? It releases microfibers into the water. It comes right back to us. 92% of US tap water contains traces of microfibers. You just drink that. And so why not create a monster calling other washing machines? It felt, you know, like a great way to start a new conversation. Did a project on e-waste. Did you know that electronic waste is the fastest growing municipal waste stream in the world? Less than 15% of electronic waste is recycled. You know, we have a finite world, finite resources. And so we have to find ways to harness past technologies in order to power the future that we want to see. What was really interesting about this journey was that because I had chosen to ignore the al algorithms and I had chosen to pursue a different kind of relevancy, every success, every step forward that I took in my career, all these projects that I felt like I was getting better at was actually taking a step back. It was almost as if I was losing the ability to reach the very people I was trying to connect with because I was refusing to play the game. And so what do you do as an artist that's going against the grain? Um, what do you see? This is one of my latest projects. It's a three-story tall art installation. It's a giant faucet spewing plastics all over different environments. That little guy in the front in yellow is my nephew. He was born during the pandemic. Also during the pandemic, single-use plastic production went up by 250%. And if we take the entire course of human history, we've produced over 9 billion tons. Most of it's still on the planet today. Why? Because plastics actually doesn't disappear. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. And so I feel deeply concerned about the future. What you don't see is that when I built this project, I built it with the understanding that no matter how good the art was, I didn't actually think it would be relevant. I didn't think it would spread. I didn't think, I didn't think people would resonate with it. And so, I took that fear of irrelevancy and I decided, well, what can I do about it? I thought, well, one thing I can do is ask for help. So one of the things I did is I took this faucet symbol, I reached out to external communities, artists, and I said, hey, I've created this thing, I'm gonna do a launch, would you like to be a part of it? I didn't know what to expect, I'd never done it before, but this time around it was a really interesting response. This idea of open sourcing art and activism and giving people a tool, a message, a movement to be part of allowed things that I could have never envisioned or created on my own to exist in the world. And suddenly people, influencers who were, who were normally creating entertainment, were now creating art. The other thing that I wanted to do was thinking that, well, if I can create projects like this, what if, I, what if, what if that failure, what if I could take that failure and use it simply as a stepping stone? What if, what if that failure could be the beginning of something greater. And so I started looking around, and there was one event that was going to be taking place in Nairobi, Kenya. It's the 
probably the most significant event in the history of plastics to take place as an environmentalist, where delegates from 193 different countries, 1,500 delegates were going to come to talk about a global plastics treaty. And I thought, what if I could get that art installation on display there? Same thing. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to get funding. I didn't know how to get permission. But I reached out, asked for help, found a community, Web3 community called the Degenerate Trash Pandas, decided to fund this art installation, reached out and found an NGO who actually helped us build this thing called the Human Needs Project. The plastics that you see were cleaned by 60 women uh, from, from the township of Kibera, Africa's largest slum. We hired them for three, four days just to tie three tons of, of plastic together so that this could be featured at that art installation. And I think what is maybe the most interesting is what happens next. Because all these people taking selfies and photos and using the art as a tool for conversation are actually using a byproduct of my fear of irrelevancy, of feeling like no matter what I do, it's never going to be enough. And that fear that has driven my entire career in some way, shape, or form is actually turning out to be probably the most powerful thing that could have come out of it. And so what I'd like to end on is that if you're feeling very small in a world of very big problems, and you're feeling like you don't know how to solve anything, and that no matter what you do, it just isn't enough, well, lean into it. Because it is in our collective fear of irrelevancy that we actually do things that are relevant. Thank you very much.